public's investment in the permanent fund through the dividend. In each of these cases, the Senate leadership is derelict in protecting the public interest. And I think that's our big issue here and why these three issues are thematically connected, even though they appear to be thematically different. It's about the public interest. Thank you. And are there any questions? James Brooks from the Juno Empire. Uh, on the marijuana issue, Senator Pete Kelly implied that he will do a resolution on marijuana. Have you had any discussions or talks with him on that? Um, he has suggested that we do a resolution, and I've declined to do it. I don't see any advantage. It's faster to do a sense of the Senate, has the same impact, and um, it's harder to bury. Um, Steve Quinn with Channel 11. So um, if the sense of the Senate is faster, why the urgency? Is there a particular deadline that I'm missing here? Um, well, the urgency is, first of all, to assure Alaskan businesses and investors in this new industry that we've got their back and we're fighting for their protection against federal government, basically. Um, but the other thing is that Senator Murkowski will be here, I believe, on the 22nd, and we want this to be available for her um, to support her efforts in the with the federal government to roll to go back to the coal amendment, which makes sense. Yeah. And what kind of uh, feedback have you uh, received from the uh, delegation so far? I mean, I, I, I know they're public statements, but just... I'm, I'm relying on their public statements. I'd like to have the sense of the Senate with broad support from the body to give them and say, we are, we are all with you, not just the three of us here. If I could add to that, <clears throat> Senator Murkowski did say that she had spoken numerous times, I think that's the exact quote to um, to the uh, Department of Justice about this very issue. So it's it's certainly not a passive issue for them, and we ought to be able to show our support. The, the Senate majority never hesitates to put a resolution before this delegation when they come to visit and speak to us, and they did it last year on issues that were pending at the time, and this is an issue that's pending now. And so her exact words, or at least as far as I know, are, over the past year, I repeatedly discouraged, discouraged Attorney General Sessions from taking this action and asked that he work with the states and with Congress if he feels changes are necessary. Today's announcement, this was from October 4th, I mean January 4th, is disruptive to state regulatory regimes and regrettable. And I myself would put that in boldface italics. James Brooks from the Juno Empire. This morning we had an announcement from the Senate Republicans that they've turned down the governor's uh, appointment for S District E. Wanted to get your all's thoughts on what should be done. Well, the governor has followed the law. He's well within his rights. It's not a new process at all. Um, and I think that the man who had been nominated Kowalki um, had already filed to run, and he may very well be here. I think the Senate's action risks starting out on a wrong foot with a new colleague. Um, but we'll see. The governor will come up with somebody else, as he's required to do, and he is, his measure will be the best choice he can find. Else? James Brooks from the Juno Empire again. Uh, Yesterday we heard from Speaker of the House Bryce Edgman in a press conference and he said he now has doubts about the 90-day deadline. Do you share those doubts? Anybody want to take that? I'll, I'll start and then maybe okay. pass it over. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm, I'm an internal optimist and, you know, fundamentally the leadership controls that agenda. I still think we can get out of here in 90 days and I think it's our obligation and responsibility to do so. And I would agree. I'll, I'll just say the decisions will not get any easier as we get closer to the 90 days. And in my experience, what tends to happen is the decisions are just kicked down the road towards towards the end, toward the 90th day or the 120th day. And um, it, they don't get any easier. You've, there will have to be very tough decisions that are made this session. And uh, let's make them within the 90-day voter-mandated uh, time frame, is my opinion, rather than kicking them down the road. And um, they don't get any easier. Uh, Steve Quinn with KTVA. 90 days just doesn't seem to be a reality. Um, why the optimism that you can get done in 90 days? Well, I'm, I'm mildly optimistic, let's say, um, because 
with the possible exception of a couple of new legislators, everybody knows the stakes. Everybody knows what the options are. Everybody knows the advantages and the disadvantages. You know, it's time to make a decision. It's past time to make a decision. Well, let me add to that. Uh, we've already, the House has already passed an education budget. The Senate is, and the House have both looked at early funding of education. A bill is moving already in the Senate in regards to that as well, SB 131. We, um, we clearly know what the lines are from the, uh, from the uh, House and Senate uh, finance subcommittees. There doesn't seem to be a whole lot of difference there. Uh, you know, if, if this is simply about posturing and negotiating, there's really no point to it. it. You know, as we said earlier in talking amongst ourselves, you know, we've been to this road here before, and this ride is, you know, this ride has been one that we don't need right now. You know, this is not a necessary uh, process. It, it, it's not difficult in 90 days. If we're at day 30 and we already know uh, essentially the parameters of the budget, why not be able to resolve it and move on? And, and that really is the fundamental, always the fundamental sticking point when it comes to these extended sessions. In a scenario where some version of SB 26 comes to the floor without any additional revenue uh, options like an income tax or sales tax or what have you, uh, would you support it? I think that I'm going to go out on a limb here, but I think we're all agreed that absent we will not support an effort that's PFD only. And that's another form of PFD um, usage. It's going to reduce people's permanent fund dividends when you spend down that money. Um, and when we look at what's happening to the permanent fund now with this um, economic downturn or the, how the stock markets have done, we can see that that is not reliable by itself. We need a different form of revenue also to balance out things and create stability for the state so we're not subject to the swings of the stock market, the swings of the oil industry. We, we need something stability. Yeah. Bill, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I'll, I'll just, I, I, I'm not going to support any use of the earnings reserve until the voters have a right to, to put the uh, uh, dividend in the Constitution because there is no, there is no protection for the people of Alaska unless we put it in the Constitution. You could pass Senate Bill 26. And that doesn't guarantee anything. That doesn't guarantee a dividend. In fact, we ran amendments uh, last time that bill came around to, to, guarantee, to actually put shall, that they shall pay a dividend, and they rejected it. The majority rejected it. So, um, uh, you know, there's nothing that can protect the dividend at this point unless you put it in the Constitution. Yeah, and, and James, I'll add, here's the tragedy here. You've got uh, a situation where uh, I, I heard one member of the Senate majority leadership in that, in that press avail, and, and he's quoted basically saying, well, we got the breathing space of more oil, so we don't have to make these tough decisions. And that is so short-sighted. Fundamentally, we're going to come back to the same question again and again and again at the whim of the price of oil. So make a plan, and let's talk about a comprehensive plan. The House was willing to, to go out on a limb and pass a comprehensive plan. They did it. The uh, governor has presented a comprehensive plan. It really is up to the Senate leadership to present a comprehensive plan that includes revenue, use of earnings and protection of the dividend. It's not hard to do, and they ought to have the guts and skill to do it. To follow up on that, I believe I got Senator Wilikowski's answer from his previous comments, but in a scenario where Senate Bill 26 doesn't come up and you're asked to draw from the earnings reserve without a bill, I'm, I'm assuming you're still a no on that. Yeah. And then... Um, do you, what do you think will happen? What do I think will happen here at the end of the session? <laughs> we're all going to be in, we're going to have a lovey-dovey time, aren't we? It's all going to work out. Um, do you want to try that? <clears throat> I, I, mean, I, I think it's pretty clear where the, the Senate is headed. They want to just use the earnings reserve. They want to use as much of it as possible. And uh, it is the most regressive way to solve the budget problem. I think, I think that's where they're clearly headed. Additionally, the Senate majority continues to rely on just spending down every savings account they can possibly find. And as David Thiel, the ledge um, finance director, said, it doesn't work. We can't keep doing that. It's, those days are done. 
we, we can't fund the budget on that. They, has, they have to do something different. And I think that we're not the only ones who will refuse to use just the earnings reserve um, to support that effort. I think they have problems in their own caucus there. I, and I would say that, um, I would say, while I, I, the pessimistic side of me thinks that, in fact, what my colleagues have described is where we're headed and that very likely will be the outcome, my optimistic side, which I was speaking to earlier, believes that the, there is enough will within the majority to pass some level of revenue beyond uh, you know, the, the 26 plan or the dividend only plan, but to, to pass some revenue to recognize that we have to to do that piece of it. I do believe that they they potentially could get there and that that will be revenue modified by the House and that uh, will come back to us and, and, and will happen. I also believe that there's movement now. I've been seeing it not just in the letters I've been receiving and that the others have received, but even uh, from, um, from the governor's office potentially and others, that we, we, I think there's a serious look at constitutionalizing the dividend. And I think that could actually uh, you know, maybe catch a little air. We're snowboarding gold medalists all around, so maybe we catch a little air, and, and that uh, could be the gold medal from this session. Um, Steve Quinn, the KTVA. Uh, last year, um, Senator Hoffman said it might be best if the two sides pursue what they agree upon and at least get that accomplished. How do you feel about that? And I've got to follow up. Well, that seems like a good strategy for everybody. I mean, it's how bipartisan coalitions work. They focus on where they can find some agreement. Um, and there's no reason that the two bodies can't do the same thing. Hopefully early funding of education for a start. Uh, my second question is, how come no one has wished James a happy Valentine's Day? <laughs> We did. We did when he walked in. When we walked in. <laughs> Have we got a good camera shot of that? that <clears throat> okay, last question. Sure. Um, you had mentioned you believe that uh, it, it's pretty clear where the Senate majority is headed on, on what they want on having a permanent phone-only plan. Uh, why do you think that is? <laughs> That's what they say. That's what they've said. <laughs> I mean, they, they've rejected any other sources of new revenue. But they, what motivation do you believe is behind that? I, I, I really can't speak to their motives. I, yeah. I mean, that, that's actually a very good question to ask them, James, because, <laughs> you know, for us to speculate on their motives is really, uh, would be unfortunate. So. Thank you very much.